So are there any questions of Trish, Jason, Michael or Kate? Hi, uh, Margie Atkinson from JCU. This is for Michael Lyons. I was really interested in your IVF project. Is that something that other people are doing or is this really cutting edge and out there? I think someone else would be able to have a better opinion than me. It's very new for us and in our area. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think it's, um, it's very popular in Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, we went to this uh, in vitro Brazil and they transferred 40,000 embryos that year. Um, so it's very popular. But I mean, maybe Jason or Kate could give a, a better indication of how prevalent it is in... Yeah, I think you've summed it up well. In other countries, it's a lot more prevalent than here. Um, I think what's more important is the application of the range of technologies. So there's not much use using IVF to, to get you know, more of something that's not destined or you know, has a good use for your business. And I think what, um, what these guys have shown is how you can actually use multiple selection tools and technology to speed up that process. So I think it's a great example of how to use technologies. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that was very exciting. Thanks. My question is for Kate. My name's Caroline Gunning-Trant from Bears. I was just interested that you said you took a DNA sample from every carcass, and I was wondering for how long those samples are held. Sure. We do. We take a DNA sample from every carcass processed under our certified Australian Angus beef and Angus pure brands, and those samples are held for three months, and that's managed by Zoetis, formerly Pfizer Animal Genetics. Three months is generally the life of the product, so hence why the samples only kept for that long. Uh, just a question for uh, Jason, uh, Phil Tickle from the CRC for Spatial Information. You, um, you describe yourself as a sort of a major player in the Australian market, but a, but a minnow in the, from a global context. In, in terms of the innovation, the technology development, the R&D, and I suppose as you move forward in terms of, kind of developing a competitive edge, to what extent do you see other, you know, family through to other corporates in the Australian market as your competitor or as effective as your partner to drive some of this sort of this innovation and change uh, from an industry's perspective? Um, thanks, Phil. So, from our point of view, absolutely as partners. So we don't see any um, producers as competitors. Um, and I, I, I have trouble seeing anybody in the supply chain as a competitor. You know, and if you want to, and it, it sounds a, a bit um, uh, you know, theoretical, but you know, other other proteins is what you know people talk about being as competitors. But the global demand in the next you know, have many years up to you know, 2050 for animal proteins is going to far outstrip um, demand, and we, we've got a lot more challenges in front of us than than competition. And you know, one of them is using technology, increasing productivity. But producing for Australia, you know, it's being able to produce the product that consumers want. So when you look at technology, um, I think the biggest challenge we have is the socialisation of research and development and the way that's applied. And because of the fragmentation of the industry uh, and the decision making processes we have, you know, we end up with uh, what we get agreement for as far as R&D is concerned, whether that be support or the actual programs, uh, then actually has limited utility right across the industry. And if you just take um, livestock improvement, so you know, genetic technologies, for example, when you look at the average size herd, uh, for someone to apply new genetic technologies, it has to have a very high level of accuracy because they have a small number of animals. If it's only got a 50% accuracy and you've got you know, two head, then one will be good, one will be bad. You know? So this is difficult. But if you've got larger numbers, the size of an effect is much more important than the accuracy. So if you can shift a population to increase compliance or shift the population to increase productivity, that actually provides real value to the industry. Yet it's very hard for our R&D to be applied that way because it's so fragmented. So I think competition's the least of our worries and, um, and that's probably 
restrains us where people see, you know, trying to trying to retain information or, or advantage and think that that's going to help them. And we're very much of the you know, collaborative view moving forward, regardless of whether that be other people supplying into a similar supply chain to us or partners that service process or feedlot for us or you know, help us market, whatever it might be. Um, we've got to have a lot more collaboration and, and focus on the on the big game, which is the global demand for animal proteins. Hi, I'm Ellie Triscothic, um, Angus and fat lamb producer from Holbrook. Um, Kate, just a question for you. Firstly, thank you. Any chance for us as commodity producers to value add our product, we welcome, and CAG have done an amazing job at that. Um, you mentioned you've been around for about 40 years. Why has it taken others so long to do the same sort of thing? I know Hereford Society are talking about branding their product at the moment. So I guess, sorry, getting to the question is, do you think other breeds will follow and will this confuse consumers and will there be a proliferation or a saturation of branded beef products in the market? Ellie, before I answer your question, I appreciate I owe you an email with some information that you asked me for two weeks ago. <laughs> um, I see it as a positive thing, new brands coming into the market in terms of brands based on breed or raising claim. Um, I think the, the consumer demands and, and the, consumer, the consumer demands and is not only getting more discerning about what they eat but where it comes from and how it's raised. And if that's what the consumer wants, then that's what we should deliver. And other brands offer a point of difference. And I think with other brands, they, need to, they will manage their quality and they will manage their, their marketing materials, etc. And they will be responsible for their success or failure. And Angus will continue to do what we do and we will continue to be innovative and just try and keep ourselves out there. In, in answer to your part about will it confuse them, not if done properly. So it's about the level of information you give them, keeping it simple but keeping it truthful and making sure that the consumer has a point of difference to choose from. Hello, Jason, Catherine Marriott here, how are you? Good. I was just wondering, um, with regards to your new abattoir in the north, how do you think that's going to affect the live export industry and what do you think that's going to do or how do you think that's going to contribute to the viability of the northern beef industry as a whole? Thank you. Um, th thanks, Catherine. I think it can only have a positive impact on the live export industry. It, they're totally complementary. So the plant we're building in Darwin is a largely a manufacturing plant, so it's main source of suppliers cull cows and uh, the live export industry of course is mostly young cattle or or you know, some cows but they're not they're not necessarily cull cows all the time so the more demand for live export cattle the more young cattle you need you need the more cows you need to produce them so we think that you know, they're very very complementary and um, as one of the largest producers of cull cows that's obviously the driver behind the plant but we're also one of the largest live exporters as well so you know, we certainly wouldn't create something that's going to um, uh, solve one problem and create another. We see them as being totally complementary. Most importantly, uh, provides alternative marketing options for cattle out of the north, which historically have had very limited options. So manufacturing type cattle have had either a very long road trip or very limited market options. And, and certainly providing an alternative market for those cattle is, is the driver for the plant. So, and we see it as having an opportunity to you know, revolutionise that northern production system, turn the cow herd over faster, you know, cull on performance, because you know that you can actually capture value for those cows and replace them with a you know, high performing young female. And that'll be certainly the way we'll use it in our company. Yeah, Lindsay Ferguson from Regional Development Victoria. A uh, question for Kate. Uh, early on in your presentation, you talked about uh, your organisation owning a business which did the testing of the uh, genetics. Is that correct for um, for Angusness? I'll just have to get you to clarify what you mean. The testing of the genetics. So you mean in terms of verifying breed? That's correct. Yeah. So how we how we do breed verification is in a very commercial manner. 
It's done through um, both producer declaration, visual assessment, phenotypic, true to phenotype. So to place an impost on the producer to genetically prove that that animal was Angus through DNA testing would just be another cost, which would be not only um, commercially difficult, but unsustainable in the turnaround time. It could take up to six weeks to receive results and your cattle are ready to go. So we don't own the company that does the genetic testing. We own the company that, uh, that wrote the standard for what, what constitutes Angus and how, and how that program must be managed to ensure that's achieved and assured. <coughs> does that answer your question? Yep, thank you. Uh, Trish, if I may, um, sitting up there having no questions. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, global stockpiles of beef, given that uh, everyone had plenty of warning that uh, once the season broke in Australia, red meat, particularly beef, may become uh, in, in, uh, in a shorter supply. And you, you've mentioned that the US uh, is starting to rebuild its herd. Brazil's got uh, greater access to other markets. Has the beef, in particular, uh, on a global market, has it peaked? And is it starting to come off? Is it starting to come off? The is it globally, do you think we've seen the peak? Oh, it's, 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 it's hard to say. Um, I think it's got a, a longer to run. Um, we've, uh, I mean, our, our supplies will come off uh, quite a bit. I think Brazil is, is also uh, sort of their supplies are, are looking at being down as well. Their exports are certainly down. US exports, I mean, they, they don't have a lot of access to export into Japan. Um, they will keep concentrating on that market. But um, yeah, I think, I think we've got quite a few years to run yet. Hmm. OK, if uh, there's no further questions, I'd like you to uh, thank our speakers this afternoon. Uh, thank you for the staying on time and uh, answering the questions. So uh, thank you very much to uh, Kate, Michael, Jason and Trish. Thank you.